Uh, my name is Susan Smith and I'm Campaigns Manager for, for the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations and I'm delighted to be hosting this webinar this morning. Uh, we've got six great finalists of the Campaign of the Year um, award to get through and we've only got 45 minutes so we've got a lot to get through. So just a little bit of housekeeping just to say that your um, lines are muted if you are not a participant. Um, but you can chat amongst yourselves and introduce yourselves to other people in the audience via the chat function. Um, we're going to be um, chatting to the different finalists and asking them about their campaigns. If you have specific questions for one or all of them, you can uh, use the Q&A function to ask that question and I'll try and get to that later on in the webinar. And also this webinar is being recorded, as you've just seen, um, so you will be able to share it with your um, colleagues afterwards. So moving on this morning, we've got six amazing charities who are all finalists for Campaign of the Year this, this year. Um, personally, I find it um, really moving the way when COVID hit in spring 2020, the charity sector just jumped in and started to make life better for people who are isolated, people who were um, feeling unsafe in their homes and, um, and really stepped up. These six charities, though, did even more than that. They recognised an injustice or the threat of an injustice and decided they were going to do something about that. And they all launched campaigns that um, have all been very successful in supporting people through COVID and lockdown and beyond. So this morning we have Janice McCulloch of Scout Scotland, who's going to be talking about the Save Your Outdoor Centre campaign. Catherine Thomas of Aberdeer Child Care Trust, who's going to be talking about the Arts Assistance Fund. Catherine Russell of Care Home Relatives Scotland, who will be talking about um, their campaign for Anne's Law. Stuart Allardyce of Stop It Now Scotland on the Get Help or Get Caught campaign. Lawrence Cohen is here from Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland, and he'll be talking about its Long Covid Care Now campaign and Narette Firm from RSABI, which provides practical, emotional and financial support to people involved in the Scottish agricultural industry. And she'll be talking about the Keep Talking campaign. So I'm now gonna let um, our participants do their 90 second overview of their campaign so that you get an idea of, of the range of activity that we're gonna be talking about this morning. So let's kick off with Janice. Hi there, um, I'm Janice McCulloch and I'm here representing the Save Your Outdoor Centres campaign. Um, Save Your Outdoor Centres campaign started in August 2020 last year. Um, outdoor centres, like everything else, had been closed since March 2020, but we had no idea about when our centres were going to reopen or when overnight stays would be allowed to happen again at um, residential centres. Um, if you cast your mind back, we were told that there would be absolutely no extension of the furlough um, and basically our centres were completely on a cliff edge in terms of, of not having any money to see us through. Um, many were starting to close, in fact Girl Guiding had to make the sad decision to close their centre um, around about that time last year. We were a group of um, outdoor centres who had never worked together before. Um, we uh, were essentially um, brought together around this common cause of, of making our centres stay open uh, for the future. So we didn't have a website, we didn't have a social media presence, um, and we were really starting from scratch in August last year. Our campaign was designed to reignite people's memories about their school trip, their school residential, in order to try and get them to put pressure onto the Scottish Government to get funding. We set up a petition and we set up a Twitter account and we worked together to gain support from organisations out with the sector. In just over a month, we managed to gain 25,000 signatures on our petition. We had media coverage on pretty much every single channel and we had lots of articles in the press. We also managed to get a, a members debate in the Scottish Parliament, which had to get extended time, which I've never seen before because um, so many MSPs were desperate to come and speak about their own experiences at residential centres and of course the impact that it has for young people. Um, and by the end of October last year, we managed to get two million pounds in funding to help save the outdoor centres. That's me, I'm happy to take your questions later on. 
Thanks, Janice. It really was a fantastic campaign. Um, and next up, we've got Catherine Thomas of Aberlour Childcare Trust. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Janice. It was a really fantastic campaign. I really saw lots of lots of your great stuff. I'm here from Aberlour today, and um, if we go back in time to the middle of March 2020, when it was starting to come clear that COVID-19 was going to be a serious issue, um, Aberlour was taking it very seriously because we work with many children and families who are at risk of being neglected and excluded by society at the best of times, never mind during a public health crisis. Um, and our board and our senior leadership team agreed that the lockdown would pose a significant threat to financial well-being in Scotland and decided that we, Aberlour, should take decisive action to address this really proactively. So on the 17th of March, which was in context, it was the second day of the school closures. Um, we created and launched our Urgent Assistance Fund Emergency Appeal, which, yes, we created it. We launched it on the same day, which was a fantastic achievement, particularly by our marketing and our individual giving teams. We set a really ambitious fundraising target, £100,000, to match £100,000 that our board agreed to move to the fund from Aberlour's Reserves. Um, and by the end of the following March, March 2021 this year, we had raised not £100,000, but over £1 million from individuals, companies, community groups, charitable trusts and the Scottish Government. We also commissioned Professor Morag Trainer to evaluate the fund and the impact it was having, which has informed our campaigning for public policy measures to combat poverty, such as doubling the Scottish Child Payment. We were also able to secure a Christmas partnership with the Scottish Sun, which amplified our campaigning messages as well as raising funds. So during the year of our campaign, we awarded over one million pounds to nearly, I think, 4,000 families in desperate financial need, including 7,000 children, as well as using the media and our communication channels to shine a light on poverty in Scotland. So that was our campaign. Thanks very much. It was another one that had great prominence last year. Um, and next up, we've got Catherine Russell of Care Home Relatives Scotland, which was a new group um, uh, that sprung up as a result of COVID. Hello, everyone. Um, our Care Home Relatives Scotland is a Facebook group with more than 2000 members uh, set up also in August last year. And we brought together people like myself who've been cut off from loved ones in care homes at the start of the pandemic. Well, in some ways, we were the lucky ones whose relatives had survived the, the first wave of COVID. And when the government finally published visiting guidance in July 2020, we knew it would never do. Meeting your, your, your mother, your husband, your wife outside in all weathers, two to three metres away behind police tape, or other barriers like glass screens was completely hopeless and it did nothing to lift our anxiety or the despair of many of those living in care homes. We demonstrated at the Parliament on the 16th of September and on the 18th of September, we had the first of what's now been 12 meetings with government ministers um, through which we have succeeded in influencing um, policy and um, we are now involved in many national groups. From the start, we've argued that at least one close relative should always be able to have regular personal contact with loved ones in care, using all the same safety measures as staff do. Um, we believe we're essential to the well-being of our loved ones, and that's why we support Anne's Law, which was backed by 100, 000, almost 100,000 signatures in our petition, and was discussed at the Petitions Committee in the Parliament, and is, was included in the manifestos of all the major political parties. But it's still to be delivered, so we're, all eyes are on this afternoon to see what's announced. Um, and uh, we're uh, still trying to get um, Anne's Law fully implemented. Um, so our campaign's still very much alive and kicking, although sadly now more than half the people who were in care at the start of the pandemic um, have died. Um, so, you know, it's, we realise that time is very, very urgent, and so our campaign is still... Um, very, very strong and has all the passion that, that the other campaigns uh, you're hearing about today have. Thanks very much. So, thanks, Catherine. 
Um, it really is quite amazing what a group of people who've got no experience of campaigning before have managed to achieve when it, when it really was necessary, when it was a really important cause like that. So next up, uh, we have Stuart Aldis of Stop It Now Scotland. Uh, thanks, Susan, and um, delighted to be here. Um, as you see, I'm from uh, Stop It Now Scotland, which is a charity that focuses on child sexual abuse prevention. So I'll say something about the campaign, but let me paint in a bit of context. Um, uh, current evidence tells us, that, uh, tells us that around one in six girls and about one in 20 boys will experience contact sexual abuse by the age of 16. That means that in any high school in Scotland, you would be able to fill several classrooms with children who have experienced sexual harm or exploitation. But you can't. And the reason you can is that the vast majority of children um, uh, never tell any adult at the time of their abuse what has happened to them. So our current child protection systems only ever deal with a tiny fraction uh, of those who are affected by this absolutely devastating form of harm. And that's why we believe that we need to get better at preventing sexual abuse before it happens, rather than just picking up the pieces after it's happened. So at Stop It Now Scotland, we believe that prevention involves engaging with adults, and particularly engaging with adults who present a risk of harm to children themselves. And it involves deterrence, disruption, providing early help, but also providing challenge to, to people who present the greatest risk to our, to our children in Scotland. So in April 2020, we worked with Police Scotland um, and launched a social media campaign called hashtag get help or get caught. Um, uh, and uh, that was targeted at those who are at risk of exploiting children online. It used a video which emphasised that these um, behaviours such as having sexual conversations with children online is illegal and we explained why it was illegal. Um, but we also explained that for those who wanted help to stop, there was anonymous support that was out there. Um, and indeed, in the first four weeks of the, the campaign, our website had 64,000 hits, which is a 200-fold increase in what we'd, we would have expected for that time of the year. But more importantly, many of the people who clicked onto our website then clicked onto our online program, which is designed to help people make better, uh, better and safer choices online. So even we were surprised by the, uh, the scale of uptake and the scale of, of, of success of the, the campaign. Um, but we also know that since the start of lockdown, um, that reported online sexual crime has increased by just under 20% in Scotland. Um, so we believe that campaign work like this continues to be extremely necessary at the moment. And if we don't get serious about these kind of campaigns and serious about, about prevention of child sexual abuse, we're just gonna keep on parking ambulances at the bottom of the cliff, rather than building a fence at the top to stop people falling off. Thanks, Stuart. It's a really impressive website and a really um, a, a brave and, and successful campaign. Um, so thanks very much for being here. And next up, we have Lawrence Cohen from Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland talking about the It's Long Covid campaign. Thanks very much, uh, Susan. Um, so essentially, the Long Covid campaign has been central to preventing people with Long Covid becoming the forgotten victims of the pandemic. So if you remember at the start of, the, uh, of this pandemic, uh, there was quite rightly a lot of focus on Covid and caring for people uh, who have experienced the, the very serious uh, impacts that that had. Um, but it's ha long, long COVID has had debilitating effects on people's lives and people have been living with it for months and months and their lives have been totally changed. Um, so the campaign, uh, firstly, was to raise that as an issue. Um, it is a brand new condition. So it was to uh, highlight that to uh, the public, but also educate people around about what to be looking out for in terms of long COVID. Um, and it's really quite unique in the sense that the, the campaign itself um, successfully campaigned for the building of new approaches and new services for a new condition. So the Scottish Government um, has agreed to put in place measures to improve care for people with long COVID, which is still an emergent condition and we're learning about it all the time. But thanks to the campaign, um, it, 
Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland and the Scottish Government have gone into partnership to offer a, a, a wraparound service that helps with the day-to-day -day management of some of the, the most common symptoms. Um, and there's also been £2.5 million pounds worth of funding and research. Uh, and also, more broadly, the model for caring for people with long COVID uh, it, it, that we are working with health boards on uh, due to the campaign is much more integrated than ever before. So, uh, and particularly in the areas of primary care, there's a real potential for uh, the joint working and integration between the third sector service and the NHS to be more integrated than, than ever before and really change how people are cared for in that more, um, uh, in a more seamless way. So essentially the, the Long COVID Care Now campaign was highlighting uh, a, a condition that was new um, and preventing uh, people being the forgotten victims of the pandemic uh, and also uh, really uh, set up services when there were none. So, um, you know, a, a big campaign for people. I just really want to say a massive thanks to everyone with Long COVID who got behind it and, and got involved in the campaign because given the impact that the condition has on your day-to-day -day life, that is not easy. Thanks very much, Lawrence. Yeah, again, another really important campaign. We remember when long COVID was just a rumour and, and to have taken what was just a rumour that some people were very sceptical about to, um, to turn it into, to, to get the package of support that people with long COVID are now getting is, is really great. And good luck with the continuation of that. So, and our final um, speaker, last but not least by any means, is Noreen Fern from RSABI, and she's going to be talking about the Keep Talking campaign. Thanks, Susan. Um, yeah, RSABI is a charity that provides a practical, emotional, and financial support for Scottish agriculture. And our 2020 Keep Talking campaign launched in May that year. And the main aim was to encourage people to make the time to pick up the phone and have a blether with friends, family, neighbours, check in on each other and to call us if they were struggling. Um, farming and crofting can be kind of isolating and lonely at the best of times. Lots of people are working on their own in kind of remote rural locations not seeing a lot of people so when the pandemic hit and that we felt that could really be exacerbated there was the loss of things like going to your local agricultural show or the Royal Highland show lots of people kind of arranged their annual holidays around that and also just not being able to go to the auction mart like normal and get a bit of crack with with the people you see there so um, we launched a four-week campaign and it culminated on the last day of what would have been the Royal Highland Show with a National Keep Talking Day. We were encouraged everybody to make a call to somebody that they hadn't spoken to for a while and just kind of emphasising the difference that that might make to somebody that might be feeling low or lonely. Um, we were really lucky to have Jim Smith, who's a um, TV comedian and first year farmer on board as the kind of face of the campaign. We had 12 auctioneer ambassadors from across the country on board. And we had amazing support from a host of industry organizations. They were on board as um, campaign partners. Um, the campaign also featured a kind of moving video that was actually produced kind of prior to lockdown, featuring a farming family that had been affected by suicide, talking about um, how that affected them and encouraging others to to talk. So it was all really about the importance of, of talking and I guess being part of that wider conversation of it's okay to not be okay. Um, so we had a, we didn't really have a budget to be honest because it was all <laughs> like a lot of the campaigns I'm sure it all kind of came about quite quickly. Um, so really small budget um, but we managed to achieve reach of um, over 600,000 um, people on social media and it was covered in print and, and national TV and radio. So the awareness raising that that gave us was fantastic. And demand on our helpline services really increased in the last financial year um, and they were up like 63%. So um, yeah, we're incredibly grateful to everybody that really got behind the campaign. I think the agricultural community coming together and getting, getting behind it really reflects how 
people are kind of concerned about mental health and well-being and, and want to to play a part in, in helping in that area. Thanks, Narette. It's a, a very it was a very moving campaign. And um, you know, it was all it was hard enough. Um the isolation of lockdown was hard enough for those of us in in city settings. Um, never mind if you're in the middle of uh, rural Scotland and really isolated anyway. So thank you all. Those are fantastic campaigns. And I can see in the chat, there's a lot of um, really positive uh, feelings towards the, the campaigns. Um, we've got, we've had one question submitted, but I think I'm just going to give you a bit of an opportunity to talk about some of the challenges you might have um, um, experience when running these campaigns um, because I know that it didn't always it doesn't always go smoothly um, so I thought I would start by um, asking Stuart um, you know how you identified the this particular campaign um, as the campaign that Stop It Now should be working on during COVID. Um, and you know, what challenges did, did you experience trying to set up the campaign and, and keep it going? Hold on a second, Susan, I'm just trying to, um, there we go. There's the, this, that's my video, sorry about that. Um, um, the, the campaign had been planned um, uh, prior to, to, to lockdown, um, partly because, um, we've known from working with our partners at Police Scotland, um, the scale and nature of the issues around online sexual crime in Scotland. Um, and going back to what I was saying earlier on, you know, we needed something that, that, that gets below the tip of the iceberg, something that actually um, uh, is addressed directly at those, those individuals who have not been arrested, but are uh, either potentially um, uh, moving towards criminal behaviour or already involved with such kind of behaviour, making sure that we disrupt those individuals and, and provide early support. Um, but um, the campaign in itself um, was extended uh, and developed further uh, during lockdown. And the reason for that, I think, is probably quite obvious, which is that with the uh, amount of time children were spending online uh, during lockdown um, and the challenges for parents, homeschooling, kind of supervising their the, the children and, what, and supervising what their the children were doing online, we realised that there, there was increased elevated risk towards children um, uh, in Scotland and also working with around 150 individuals every year um, who have either been arrested for sexual offences or people who are worried about whether they may, may commit a sexual offence. Many of the individuals we were working with, we, we could pick up from them that there were increased risks for many of the, 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 the individuals that, that we worked with that actually locked down for offenders and potential offenders was a time where people were exper experiencing stresses um, and therefore we needed to, to, to make sure that they were, we were doing everything that we possibly can could to um, um, kind of uh, extend the, the, this kind of campaign. So the campaign came from our, the, the intelligence work we would do, do with Police Scotland, but it, it really kind of evolved to become much larger than that what we'd originally envisaged to try and uh, respond to the increased risks that flow from lockdown for children. Thanks, thanks Stuart. And um, I wonder if I can put the, the sort of same question to Lawrence actually about, you know, there's so many things that Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland must have had to do during lockdown. Um, what, how did you identify this as the most pressing issue? I think that's a, good, that's a good question. I think uh, the, the quite simple answer is that we didn't. Uh, is the uh, there's uh, with I suppose with, with, long, with, with the work that we were doing, for example, just giving you a bit of context to the situation Chest Hunter Stroke Scotland was in, is you know we had a, we the, the first priority for the charity was survival. I think it's probably the same with with a number of of, uh, of charities. Is um, uh, and uh, also we had. Um, lots of people with our conditions um you know we care for people with stroke 
for instance, uh, COPD and, uh, and heart conditions. Let's not forget that to deal with the COVID crisis, a lot of the hospitals were being emptied to try and, uh, to try and care for people with COVID. So again, the complexity of the, of the need that we were dealing with in terms of our service was, was there too. But then, the, then the the from a kind of from a campaigning point of view, there's from a service provision and a charity existence point of view, there's fundraising that we needed to do around about our survival. There was service delivery that we needed to ramp up to uh, to make sure that we uh, dealt with uh, with the need that was out there. But from a campaigning point of view, there was a very clear injustice here that there was people with a chest. A chest condition or the impact of a chest condition, a new chest condition, COVID, um, who were just being left alone. And you know, you you, you can't um, you can't stand by and let that let that happen. So I think what what drove us to to really we were we were dealing with lots of different crises on many fronts, but from a campaigning point of view, I think the one that made us choose right this is the one that we go for. From a campaigning side of things, with with uh, with the Scottish government, is that actually that the the injustice was was clear as day. It, people just people needed help, and they needed anything, something, and their calls weren't being heard. So um, that really made the the decision a very very clear one from a campaigning point of view, um, because people who you know had. Um, what we would deem normal lives you know everything that we take for granted had that suddenly taken away because they had covid and then for weeks months later they're unable to walk to the end of their road um so uh, from a from a covid point of view that was an important story to tell an important campaign to win because uh, without people speaking up there wouldn't be the services in place or the research in place that we have today yeah absolutely yeah. And um and Jana, um tell us a wee bit about um why Scott Scout Scotland chose this campaign because um I was very aware right from the start of the, some of the amazing stuff the Scouts were doing with young people in their homes and the support they were providing to families um stuck at home in lockdown when before sort of homeschooling really got going. The Scouts were right in there. And um there was loads of great stuff going on in the communities, but instead you chose to focus on 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 the outdoor centres. Yeah, so yeah, straight away, uh, you're right, Scouts did automatically jump to Zoom and see what we could do at home. We had at home camps and, um, you know, loads of people connect in remotely and it, it was brilliant. But um, as a charity, but like what Lawrence was saying, um, you know, we run three outdoor centres, um, all of which had been closed since March. And we didn't know when we were going to be able to have school camps because a, a lot of our, our businesses from school camps, but um, our scout camps back as well and guides and all the different youth organisations that, that go on camps and, and outdoor experiences. You know, all of those primary seven residential trips that, you know, a bit of independence before you, you head off to high school, all of that had been cancelled and we were, you know, realistically facing a, a huge financial black hole ourselves, but also right across the same sector. So all of the different centres across Scotland were closed. We were hearing about all the benefits of get outdoors, do outdoor education. Um, you know, all of us were going for our daily walks, weren't we, whilst we're in lockdown and, and getting that mental health benefit. So we're all feeling the benefits of getting outdoors, realizing, realizing how good it was for us, but seeing the reality that these centres really were on the verge of closing. So there would be no more primary seven trips. There would be no more expeditions um, to these centres because once they would be closed, they'd be gone forever because it would just be too expensive um, to open them back up again. So it really felt like it was something important for us to be a part of um, and to help the sector. But it wasn't just Scout Scotland. There was um, the centres right across Scotland. It wasn't just us, it was a, a coalition of people. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, um, people must be delighted that if they're are they going back to those centres now? Did you have you had trips at, um, this summer? So not really is the answer. It's um, the the guidance was always changing, and we are starting to get trips happening again. Um, and scout camps, 
basically the, the, the rules were for a while that you could only have one person in a, in a tent or one person in a room, um, which again, doesn't really work in terms of not just finances, but in terms of safeguarding as well. Okay for maybe older age ranges, but you know, six-year-old beavers, do they want to be in a tent by themselves? Probably not. That's not the fun, is it? The fun that is getting to go and waking up at three in the morning and annoying the leaders because you're eating all the sweets, isn't it? So, um, but now we're starting to see um, camps and residentials happen again. So it's still tough. It's really tough for the centres because we've had that long period of time without, without all the trips happening. So it is still hard, but we're starting to get things happening again. Uh, brilliant. I'm sure that means so much to the young people who are who are going. Um, so I wanted to ask the other charities about some of the challenges they they might have faced. Um, because you know, um, Catherine from Care Home Relatives Scotland, it, it can't have been uh, you know you you a bunch of relatives with no experience of campaigning, and you're demonstrating outside Parliament. You're you're launching a petition. You're having meetings with government. Um, for you what do you what did you feel was the main challenge really i think the main challenge um, in looking back on it i think um was the fact that relatives had gone through eight months of of absolute hell really um, and misery and um, there was utterly no support so i think looking back and it probably one of our biggest roles has been um the support that we provided for each other i mean i noticed some of the people in the call this morning, like Dorian Reader and Marion McParland, have just shown so much kindness to people on the group. Um, I spent lots of Friday and Saturday nights trying to get people who um, who they knew their relatives were dying, but the home wouldn't let them in. And um, you know, I was on to Chief Nursing Officer, on to um, Care Inspectorate, on to Scottish Care, to Donald at Scottish Care, trying to get people in to see loved ones. Um, and obviously, I mean, we didn't have any finances at all. Um, we still don't have any finances. We've never, we've always managed to do that just with all the resources that are there in the group and all the talents for graphics, talents for research, talents for, you know, so we've been able to use um, enormous um, abilities of people that, that have just popped up in the group. You only have to say, we think we might need this or, and suddenly it's there for you, you know, because it, there are 2,000 people on the group and um, people have a huge amount at stake. Um, we have had to set up a private group now because um, so many of our relatives have died and um, people were distressed. And so we did set up a private group that's specifically for, for them. But we found that the, the media journalists who've came on board have been absolutely fantastic uh, with us. Um, and we've had a lot of support from people. So. Um, I think any challenges that were there, we've, we've always managed to overcome them. Um, our biggest challenge now is that a lot of care homes are shutting down again. People think that this has, is all sorted, but there are still lots of relatives facing really massive restrictions um, and, you know, totally cut off from their own husbands and wives and their mums and, and uh, daughters. And uh, so it's very, still very, very tough situation there. Yeah, thanks very much. It's 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 these things that people just don't realise, isn't it? That are that are really important to keep pushing. Um, Narette, um, what about RSABI? Did you have any challenges getting people on board with this campaign? Um, no, actually, I think um, I th I think because mental health is and well being kind of is a concern. Um didn't have a, a challenge in getting people on board. I think what took time was just identifying who the campaign partners should be, identifying the right people to speak to. And then there was quite a lot of kind of legwork done to, to speak to people about what we were planning to do and, and really get them on board so that people were really engaged with, with the campaign. So that, that did take a bit of time and then just as the campaign was running, just kind of light touch, getting in touch with folk to let them know, you know, this is what happened this week. If you could share this, that would be amazing. This is what's coming up next week. I think really helped. I think without that industry support, 
um, we wouldn't have achieved the kind of the reach that that we did. Um, we're a fairly small charity, but some of the partners that we had on board, you know, the combined kind of reach that they have was amazing. So, um, yeah, that was that was really positive. Great. And, um, and I'm just going to go back to Catherine Thomas from Aberlour. So, you know, the target was 100,000. You reached over a million. It felt like Aberlour, the Argent Assistance Fund, just ran. Did you face any challenges? Did you, you know, did you get to a point where people had stopped donating and you needed to sort of ramp it up again? It was really complex operation. Um and there was a lot going on and I think the biggest challenges were around that and making sure that all the, the relevant people were up to date with things as they happened. So we weren't just running a campaign, we were also scaling up our urgent assistance fund by a factor probably of five or ten. So um, people from all over the organisation were being drafted to look at applications. We were getting, you know, 20 30 applications a day. I was reading applications. I was having to make judgments on how much to recommend for amounts to, to give to families. It's not really my area of expertise, but it very quickly, you know, with a lot of support from others in the organization, we all pulled together. But at the same time, so we were scaling up our delivery. We were campaigning. We were uh, continuing to maintain um, all the services we possibly could and um, none of our staff are furloughed we continue to operate all our services either remotely or just by calling uh, families to, to offer support so we maintain that contact so all that was still happening in terms of the money coming in we were absolutely blown away by the generosity we we encountered and um it was really unexpected in many ways uh, but I think in retrospect, it wasn't overly surprising to see how generous people are and how much they care about their communities and want to support. But um, we did have challenges around, um, for example, we had to change the way we got money out previously we had been sending checks and that's a complete nightmare in the pandemic when everyone's at home so that had to change very speedily and did thanks to our finance teams who are absolutely our finance team were absolutely magnificent never complained worked I don't know how hard to get thousands of payments out that overnight um but we also had to look at our criteria and were we reaching the right people and um, were some organisations um, sending too many applications and not that not what we thought of it like that. But, you know, having to make sure that we were being fair across the spectrum when, you know, 20 or 30 applications were being looked at every day. How do we maintain consistency? So there was a lot of uh, tweaking. There was a lot of um reviewing the protocols working in an agile way and that was challenging because we had to communicate that we had to do that quickly we had to do that effectively because at the end of the day there's a family who doesn't have enough food um or a family for example trying to flee domestic abuse a family who um are at risk from predatory lenders there's so many potential harms and dangers to these families who were in many cases in at risk of destitution um so we really had to be very flexible responsive and uh communicate very very effectively uh, these were all difficult things to do but i think we learned a huge amount from it and it will definitely inform the way we do things in future as well brilliant thank you catherine um, so we've had um, a question about petitions, but it's also been answered live. And I think I think that the examples of petitions that that you've raised have shown that a petition really can be a, a useful device. Um, so because we've only got five more minutes um, to sum up, so we've not we really I knew it was going to be tight trying to um, get through six of you in a, one webinar. Um, what I'm just going to do is ask you all to very quickly give your top tip for uh, an organisation who is 
who is looking, who's seen an injustice and wants to right that injustice. Your top campaigning tip, um, I, I guess. And we will start with, well, um, Lawrence, you're a, a seasoned campaigner. I'm sure you've got a good tip. These pressures on. Uh, so I suppose a couple of short tips. First thing, uh, be very, very clear on your, your injustice. Secondly, be even clearer on your solution. That's that's those my tips. Brilliant, fantastic, uh, Janice. Yeah, I'll just I'll agree with Lawrence and I'll say um, also get the the real people involved because the biggest impact from us was the primary sevens who wrote to MSPs to say they weren't getting to go to their school camp and that they had to to change that. So get the real people involved. Oh, bless them. That's lovely. And uh, Catherine, you pro uh, Catherine Russell, you probably have a tip. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you now, right, Catherine. Right. Um, yeah. Um, well, I actually agree with what's been said. But we we were very we had a written aims and objectives right from D one, and um, what we did involve it's that balance of involving the media, involving experts. We had great support, for example, from the World Health Organization, from leading people in 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 the infection prevention and control, and with them we actually built a whole website on how to enable visiting to go ahead safely. So we weren't only saying what we wanted to do, but we were showing how it could be done. And uh, and I think if you can do those things, then you're quite in. Brilliant. And uh, Catherine Thomas, what's your top tip? Hi. Um, well, we're a very large organisation. We do a lot of different things. So for us, the real I think the real key to being successful with this campaign is that everyone in the organisation knew what we were doing, why we were doing it and wanted to make it a success. And I think that was really, really important to us to have that kind of pinpoint clarity of this is what we're doing now. We've got our day jobs. We need to maintain those. We need to keep that going. But we also have this that we are really pulling together on. And for a big organisation, I think that was really invaluable. Yeah, that's a really good tip, um, Catherine. Stuart, uh, what about you? Well, you know, it's absolutely essential that, you know, you're clear about what your call for action is, what is what it is that you precisely want people to do differently. But I think um, just as important as that is the metrics, how you measure whether people are now actually doing something different because of, of what you're asking. So um, my um, uh, top tip would be that evaluation needs to be built there into the structure of your campaign right from the start. Yeah, that's an excellent tip as well, Stuart. And I'm sure, you know, for your campaign, it's really important, but actually it's really important for all campaigns. Um, and Narette? Yes, um, I totally agree with what everybody said, and I think it kind of overlaps with a few things. Um, I think for us, um, it's kind of about storytelling and telling the story of, of real people, like Jana said. Um, I know the, the short video that we did with the the family affected by suicide had a had a real impact um, on people's on how much people wanted to get involved with the campaign. So yeah, storytelling would be my top tip. Yeah, um, I have to confess that 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 video made me cry. It it was just lovely. And um and uh, on that note, I would say that's one of my top tips is if you're trying to move people emotionally. Um, come up with something emotional. Um, anyway, um, thank you very much for to all of you, and very best of luck for the Scottish Charity Awards. I, as I said, I don't envy the judges um, who to deciding which was the 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 top campaign of the year. The reality is, all six of all six campaigns were are, are absolutely fantastic, and. You know, really, awards ceremonies shouldn't be able to pick just one, should they? But anyway, <laughs> thank you all for coming and for sharing your um, information about your campaigns and your tips and your challenges. This has been really useful for other people who um, who want to campaign and other charities who can take some learning from this. So thank you very much. And thank you to the audience 
for your comments and participation.